Hare Krishna. Grateful to be here at the Lotus Feet of Raghokulananda. And today we are discussing about Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes and the section of the Chaitanya Charitamrit is very dependent on the context of the author. Because Krishna Raj Goswami was very old and he was apprehensive whether he would be able to live long enough to describe the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya in full detail. So he is giving a quick summary of the of the pastimes. At that time it was he who was not sure whether he has enough time or not. Nowadays, especially with social media and digital outreach, you, know, you have to make all the content as brief as possible. We make a half a minute video, one minute video, one and a half minute video. Because people's attention is like a bird which might just fly away at the slightest distraction. So, either way, what he is doing is concentrating here and quickly describing the pastime. So, so the main point that he is describing is how Lord Chaitanya went to Vrindavan. And uh, Sanatana Goswami, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu met him, Sanatana Goswami suggested maybe uh, going with so many people. He was, wherever he went, he was a magnetic, charismatic personality. It was not just his personality, but it's also his potency or the love of God. Both of them attracted people to him. And so many people were following him wherever he went. So then Sanatana Goswami said that maybe Lord, if you go with so many people to Vrindavan, uh, that might not be the best. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually changed his whole plan. And he decided to go to Nilachal and then finally he came to Nilachal, stayed there and again he is going to Vrindavan now. And this was describes what he did when he reached Vrindavan. So today I'll talk on this theme of uh, how bhakti is dynamic in its application. Normally we think about Sanatana Goswami, we have one prominent image in mind. Sanatana Goswami meets Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and surrenders. And he says, my dear Lord, I do not know who I am. Ki ami? Why am I these threefold miseries afflicting me? And Prabhupada gives that as an example of how a disciple should approach the spiritual master with submission. And that's definitely important to have that mood of humble submission. At the same time, everything when we go deeper into it is complex. There are so many nuances to everything. And here we see Sanatana Goswami giving a suggestion to Lord Chaitanya. And it's not just a casual suggestion. It's a suggestion which is going to make Chaitanya Mahaprabhu change his whole itinerary. Now, anybody who is who travels across, in a small travels across the world, in a small change in the itinerary is not so easy to make. And of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu didn't have to book flights and schedule things like that. He could go wherever he wanted. But still, he had a plan in mind and he was longing to see Vrindavan. But Sanatana Goswami said, My dear Lord, maybe that's not the best thing to go like this. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepted. So the whole process of bhakti, if we have this idea, the spiritual master or the authority gives instruction and the disciple follows. That's true, but there is much more to that. Ultimately, the spiritual master and the disciple both are there for serving Krishna. So the service of Krishna, the pleasure of Krishna, that is the most important thing. And here, Sanatan Goswami, we could say almost goes against the etiquette, not entirely, but just he gives a major suggestion. But, he, so at one sense, you know, who do you think you are? It might seem a little presumptuous, and Sanatana Goswami at this point uh, is exhibiting his keen sensitivity to the mood of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the mood of Vrindavan. So he is considering, it shows that the depth of his service attitude also. 
normally if we just do what we are told to do is that reflects some service attitude but if we so if somebody gives some suggestions you know, maybe this could be done like this maybe this could be done like this then it also requires show that some level unless that person does nothing except give suggestions that is not a very good service attitude that then that suggestion is just a, a cover it's a mask for fault finding if somebody doesn't give, do anything constructive just gives just gives giving suggestions do this don't do this then that's a problem but if somebody is suggesting maybe this could be done like this that means they are putting in thought and they are thinking about how this can be most effectively done and that indicates a certain level of engagement commitment that is to be appreciated even if the suggestion is not accepted still the thoughtfulness behind the suggestion can be appreciated and everybody is voluntarily serving krishna and that spark of the desire to serve krishna we all need to fan for each other so if somebody is giving a suggestion if we appreciate their suggestion even if we don't don't implement it necessarily then they feel valued for what they are doing so sanatan goswami here gives a suggestion to shri chaitanya mahaprabhu shri chaitanya mahaprabhu is god and in terms of the hierarchy he sanatan goswami was never formally initiated by chaitanya mahaprabhu but he was like his disciple and still sanatan goswami is thinking he is thinking of both the mood of chaitanya mahaprabhu and the mood of vrindavan so the mood of chaitanya mahaprabhu he sanatan goswami feels and chaitanya mahaprabhu ponders and agrees that vrindavan is a place where if you want to relish the presence of krishna then if he is surrounded by many people around him then he will have to pay attention to them and then he will not be able to absorb himself that much in vrindavan chaitanya mahaprabhu overall if we see the last 18 years of his life he stays in puri now of course whatever the lord does is transcendental at the same time we can also use some analysis to understand or at least learn from what the lord does so lord chaitanya basically we could say he he loved solitude and he wanted close devotee association who could understand his intimate moods and that's how he stayed in puri for most of the time in fact his two world is two tours one to the south, southern part one to the northern part were immensely successful and yet if we consider from a perspective of a traveling preacher just when his tours have been successful he stops touring and he doesn't tour ever again this for 6 years is touring and 18 years he doesn't tour now what is he doing at that time he's still preaching but he's preaching not so much by reaching out to new people but reaching deeper into the hearts of his followers the whole anti leela is about how chaitanya mahaprabhu has sweet dealings with various devotees his meeting with sanatan goswami meeting with raghunath bhatt goswami his meeting with <coughs> various people like that ah <coughs> vallabh bhatt ramachandra puri the whole chaitanya most of anti leela is chaitanya mahaprabhu's meetings unless of course it is his solitary ecstasies so from the sheer amount of sheer way a person lives we can broadly understand their nature so chaitanya mahaprabhu loves solitude and when he goes to vrindavan also he would love to experience vrindavan in solitude hari shori provides in his diary that when prabhupad was in vrindavan in mayapur he was serving prabhupad and he would give massage to prabhupad and at that time he felt that if no if nobody was there in the room apart from him then his prabhupad would become very internally absorbed he felt as his realization was it's like you know, prabhupad's body is like his car and just like sometimes a person leaves a car with the mechanic you fix it up and then he goes out for a walk so he felt as if prabhupad had left his body with him and he is going around mayapur relishing mayapur so prabhupad would also relish uh, there would be a special flavor when he was alone free to absorb himself in the dham 
And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also wanted to do that. So, which, there is always a tension for us between our personal absorption and our service which is meant to help others get absorbed. Of course, for most of us in the sadhaka stage, it is the service that uses absorption. But there are times when we just want to focus on Krishna and nothing else. And sometimes at that time our duty calls and then say it's ecstatic kirtan is going on, a beautiful darshan is there, a very absorbing class is there. And then suddenly some service comes up and we have to go. And we feel a bit torn. So there's a time when we want to be exclusively absorbed and there, well, there is a time when we, want, we are happy to be socially engaged as a service. Not mundane socialization, but interacting with devotees. So here Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was followed by many, many people. And Sanatana Goswami felt that this would not be an appropriate way which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would relish Vrindavan. And not only would he not relish Vrindavan, the mood of Vrindavan might also be disrupted. At that time, now Vrindavan is much more developed, although you could say transformed is a more appropriate word, whether it is really development in the positive sense, much of the spirituality of Vrindavan is not so easy, is far less accessible now. But it's much more transformed. So that time, actually it is the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition that restored Vrindavan to some of its pristine glory. We see that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when he went there, he discovered Radha Kun. And Radha Kun is such an important place, but it had become inaccessible. So at that time, although Vrindavan was a holy place, but much of Vrindavan was very rustic, inaccessible. Not many people would go there. Of course, the great devotees would be there. And the people there were also devoted. But for a large crowd of people, that would create Rasabhas in Vrindavan. So both from the perspective of the mood of Vrindavan and the mood of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sanatana Goswami felt, better you don't go with so many people. So here, uh, this, this is the specific context to make sense of why Sanatana Goswami gave that suggestion. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, accepted the suggestion. So, so basically, the theme, if you want to universalize this, is that there is a path or a process and there is a purpose of that path and process. And there can always be this tension between people who say that this is how things are to be done. And there are people who say, this is why things are to be done and this is how it is not working. So we could say, broadly speaking, there are people who are conservatives and there are people who are liberals. Now, there can be two broad understandings of how to do things. It's a, it's a, in philosophy, it is called as contextual ethics and categorical ethics. Categorical ethics is that this is right, this is wrong. These are two categories and that's how things are. Contextual ethics is that yes, there are categories, but context determines what falls where. So according to categorical ethics, a, dis uh, a disciple is simply meant to follow the instruction of the spiritual master. That's all. And that's true. At least, so the, the moral categories are very important to know. If we, don't, if we don't understand black and white, then we might think everything is a shade of grey. No, there is black and white and it's important to understand that. These are categories. This is how it is to be done, this is how it is not to be done. But then once that category is understood, then after that, there is a purpose. That, okay, this category is meant for what purpose? So there are values, but then there is a hierarchy of values. So being submissive to the spiritual master is one value. Pleasing the spiritual master is another value. Being submissive, to, if you would apply that to devotees in general, being submissive with devotees is one value. Pleasing devotees is another value. Normally it might be that being submissive is the way to please. But sometimes that might not be the way to please. Sometimes that might not be the way to serve the purpose. So bhakti is dynamic in the sense that there is a path to be followed, there is a process to be followed, but we are not uh, ritualists in the sense that 
we also have to keep in mind the purpose and sometimes most of the times it is following the path that will take us to the purpose but sometimes the path may not take us to the purpose and that so that's why we have to be conscious of the path conscious of the practical process but also we have to con con be conscious of the purpose so niyamagraha if we can apply this for where you know the i said talk about conservatives and liberals both can go towards the extremes and that is included in the two meanings of niyamagraha niyamagraha is at one level first it says is to just follow the rule agraha forgetting its purpose and the other is to reject the rule itself agraha to not accept at all just reject the rule entirely so we could say that those who are conservatives they can err on the side of the first just follow the rule and not keep in mind the purpose this is how things are to be done but this is not leading to the desired no this is how it was done this is how it is to be done that's all nothing doing so that could be there could be a extreme where we accept the letter but forget the purpose forget the spirit but the liberals can go towards the other extreme where i might say this path is we are not moving forward by this path and suppose we are we are maybe driving and there is a lot of traffic or there is a lot of road construction we are not moving on this path is not taking me to my destination let's find another path so the conservatives are say stay to this path only the liberals may say let's find another path but in trying to other find another path if suddenly they decide to go cross country and you might find that is much more difficult there is a look, in giving up what has been done in a traditional way there is a lot of danger there is danger and agraha just rejecting the rule because at present it is not serving the purpose that can backfire tradition is like the tree on which we are sitting we are on, we are all sitting on a branch and the tradition is like the tree of a branch on which we are sitting and if we break the branch we don't know how high we are and we don't know how badly we will fall so we can't be indiscriminate in just saying oh this is not working give it up no we have to have we have to be conscious that this path has been followed by many many people in the past and we can't just we can't just simplistically casually nonchalantly reject it so the extreme in liberalism is this is not working just give it up so both can go towards the extreme and this is niyamagraha in either way so if we are conscious of the path okay this is the path to follow and we are conscious of the purpose then we can see this is the path i'm following and this is the purpose is this taking me there and if i go and don't go this way if i go this way am i going to reach there faster so as long as if we, if we stick only to the path then hey, this is what we have been doing how dare you change it how can you be so 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 presumptuous that's what the conservatives may say and the liberals may say no, we're not moving forward by this path how can you be so blind there's no there's no progress but we have to look not just at the path at the purpose and this we see this mood we see even in uh, the famous verse from the padma uh, from the purana from the vishnu purana sarva vidhi nisheda sur etayo reva kinkaram smartavya satatam vishnu vismartavyam najatu chit at the purpose of all rules and regulations is to remember krishna and to never forget krishna all rules and regulations are meant to be subordinate to this purpose so i'll talk a couple of examples of how this process and purpose uh, need to be integrated if you look at sri chaitanya mahapuj life sri chaitanya prabhupad is the most prominent follower of sri chaitanya mahapuj in the modern times nobody has done as much to spread chaitanya mahapuj's legacy as shri prabhupad has done and shri prabhupada often insisted that i didn't change anything that you know i just followed my spiritual master 
and that meant that he if we see what does it mean prabhupada says that my purpose in writing the bhagavad gita he says in the bhagavad gita introduction our purpose in writing the bhagavad gita is the same as krishna's purpose in speaking the bhagavad gita krishna's purpose in descending to the world that is raising people to god consciousness so prabhupad nobody can be as faithful to shila chaitanya mahaprabhu as shila prabhupad and yet we see this uh, dynamism of process and purpose in shila prabhupad's following chaitanya mahaprabhu when chaitanya mahaprabhu was living in puri the king at that time pratap rudra was desperate to meet lord chaitanya and chaitanya mahaprabhu repeatedly refused time and time again he just refused and finally it it was when he adopted the dress of ordinary peasant then chaitanya mahaprabhu gave him his mercy and why did chaitanya mahaprabhu refuse to meet him he said that what will people think of me if they see me hobnobbing with with the wealthy with the powerful with the kings a uh, renunciate is to expected to demonstrate renunciation and in general in the world uh, people if anybody is famous anybody is powerful anybody is influential people want the privilege of proximity the pride of proximity oh i know this person generally when people say people may say a famous movie star a famous cricketer a famous politician anybody celebrity i know this person well you know this person whether this person knows you that's a different question <laughs> but this is a normal human tendency which everyone has and a sanyasi should be free from that that tendency to try to establish one's fame by associating with the famous and that was the mood at that time So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you could say, zealously avoided meeting, meeting uh, the king, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also, as a sannyasi, was very strict. He would not meet closely with his female followers. Sannyasis, that's also something not to be expected, uh, not to be done. And Shri Prabhu Pa, who was the, you could say, the most faithful follower of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in modern times, what did he do? he was on a world tour he was in america and he got an opportunity to meet the then prime minister of india indira gandhi so she was the head of state and she was a woman and prabhupad not only met her prabhupad curtailed his international tour just to come from america to india to meet her so chaitanya mahaprabhu was in puri the king wanted to meet him chaitanya mahaprabhu did not meet him prabhupad was in america and actually prabhupad's disciple prabhupad wanted to meet the head of state prabhupad's disciple set up follow set up the meeting and prabhupad went through all the trouble to meet meet her so if we if we are just uh, if we follow uh, categorical ethics over here we we'll say chaitanya prabhupad is doing the opposite of what chaitanya mahaprabhu did but although it was opposite in process it was consistent in purpose how is it consistent in purpose that in today's world or maybe in the world of 4 5 decades ago also that if if a spiritual leader is seen with the head of a state then actually that's not going to do any harm to the reputation of the spiritual leader that's actually going to increase improve enhance the reputation and not it was not just a matter of reputation for prabhupad actually it was to some extent when prabhupad's book was first time in the road bhagavatam and then indian prime minister lal bahadur shastri appreciated it and he wrote some appreciative note so prabhupad used that to have his books distributed uh, to all the library major libraries in india as well as he used that to distribute his books in america so reputation does matter and in today's world the reputation would be enhanced 
So mm-hmm. if we are trying to share Krishna consciousness in the world, we need to mind f- be mindful of the world's perceptions. Of course, we cannot make our mind full of the world's perceptions. There are two different things. Be mindful means you have to be aware. Okay, if I do this, this is how people see this. If they do this, this is how people are going to see it. Now that should not be the sole basis for deciding what we do. If we make our mind full only of that, our mind has to be primarily full of Krishna. But we also have to be mindful of how people are perceiving. So what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Srila Prabhupada did was ultimately serving the same purpose. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, by keeping a distance from the king, demonstrated the purity of his renunciation and that inspired people to hear him and to fix their minds on Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada, by meeting the head of the state, he, that convinced many people that, oh, this Swami must be special. He gets to meet the head of the state, must be a big person. And that inspired people to hear his message. And that enabled them to fix their mind on Krishna. So the, there is a process or a path and there is a purpose. And Srila Prabhupada, when he says that I didn't change anything, what it essentially means is he didn't change the purpose even an iota. He didn't change the purpose even an iota. The purpose was consistently in his mind. And that's what he pursued constantly. But the specifics, Prabhupada was faithful and he was resourceful. Faithful to the purpose, resourceful in pursuing the purpose according to time, place, circumstance. I'll conclude with another example, then we can have questions. So if we consider Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, in the title itself, Prabhupada says Bhagavad Gita as it is. And yet, if we read the Bhagavad Gita, we'll see sometimes the Sanskrit is saying Karma Yoga and Prabhupada is saying Bhakti Yoga. It's translating as Bhakti Yoga. In the sixth chapter, Krishna is telling, go to the forest, to Jaudeshe, Patishtha, Pyasthiramasana, Matmana, Nati Uchritam, Nati Echam. Krishna gives an elaborate description of how to go to the forest and perform yogic meditation. And Prabhupada in the purport says, this is not practical. We should chant Hare Krishna. So now, here you could say Prabhupada is not only not commenting on Krishna's words, in his commentary, he is contradicting Krishna's words. And he is contradicting Krishna's words and then he has the, a critic might say, he has the audacity to say that this is Bhagavad Gita as it is. How, how do you figure that? Actually, Prabhupada is very transparent in what he is doing. There are some Gita commentators who give their own interpretation that they don't give the Sanskrit at all. Just give the way they translate the words and they give their commentary. So Prabhupada gives us the Sanskrit, Prabhupada gives us the word to word translation, Prabhupada then gives us the translation in the purport. So what Prabhupada does, he doesn't change, he lets us see that the original Sanskrit is Karma Yoga. But then he is translating it as Bhakti Yoga, as Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada doesn't hide what he is doing. And Prabhupada says in a lecture what his purpose was. Prabhupada's mood was that people in Kali Yuga are so distracted. Mandabhagya Upadruta. And people not really focused in understanding scripture deeply. So his mood was that people might just, people are so lost spiritually that they might just pick up one book and read one page. And in that one page, any page of his book, Prabhupada, people, if people would open, Prabhupada wanted them to get the essential message of the scripture. And when, if he said Prabhupada is contradicting Krishna, it's not exactly correct. Because Krishna himself contradicts himself. In the sense that Krishna gives Jnana Yoga, Krishna gives Dhyan Yoga, Krishna gives Karma Yoga, but then Krishna himself says, Sarva Dharman Parityaj Mamekam Sharanam Raja. Just give up all varieties of religion and surrender to me. Now, when you read this verse, you may think, you know, if I had to give up all this, why did I have to study all that? <laughs> no, the point is 
that study all that to see how all that culminates in this and then when krishna says give up all this to do this give up all other paths to practice bhakti it doesn't appear fanatical if all the reasoning pre prior to that is not given it will appear fanatical but when it is followed by all the reasoning it seems not it is not seen not as fanatical but as philosophical as the culmi conclusion culmination of the philosophy so again in terms of process or path what prabhupad may be doing seem to be objectionable okay this is the words but the purport is the opposite but in terms of purpose what krishna is doing at the end of the gita prabhupad is doing throughout the gita so prabhupad is fulfilling krishna's purpose and thus just as the prabhupad was resourceful we also need to be resourceful in our personal practice as well as our sharing of krishna bhakti that there is a process but there is a purpose and we have to make sure that we practice and share krishna bhakti in a way that serves the purpose even if that requires at times doing things in a way that might not be the normative norm normative way as shri sanatan goswami did when he gave a suggestion to chaitanya mahaprabhu to revise his plans to go to vrindavan so i'll summarize i spoke today on this theme of the dynamism of bhakti how shri chaitanya mahaprabhu was going to vrindavan sanatan goswami despite being his disciple despite have not having met chaitanya mahaprabhu many times suggests but better don't go with so many people and chaitanya mahaprabhu listens to the suggestion and revises it and he goes much later so what's going on over here it's it seems very opposite to the etiquette of how a disciple should relate to the spiritual master follow instruction not give suggestion uh, but they we discussed how uh, jayadan goswami was so deeply devoted that when he was giving a suggestion it was not out of arrogance or presumptuousness it was because of thoughtfulness and that the, we talked about the mood of chaitanya mahaprabhu how he loved solitude that's why he was in gambhira in, in puri for so many years at the peak of his preaching career and he would relish vrindavan much better if he was he if he could go without so many people and vrindavan also being at that time at least a very uh, isolated secluded place lots of people there would disrupt the mood so he focused on the purpose and thus if he required he adjusted the etiquette at that time and then i talked about how there is contextual and categorical understanding of ethics that there is a path and there is a process so the the conservative say this is how it has been done this is how it always has to be done the liberal say this is not working we need to do something else now both can go towards extremes niyama agraha just stick to the letter even if it is not fulfilling the purpose but niyama agraha how oh, it's not working just give it up so tradition is like a tree if we cut the branch we don't know how far we'll fall down so you have to be very careful if we are changing anything but that doesn't mean we be paranoid and not consider the context and i talked about two examples of how shri prabhupad uh, was dynamic so prabhupad was faithful but he was also resourceful in making sure that the purpose was served chaitanya mahaprabhu didn't meet pratap rudra but chaitanya mah shri prabhupad curtailed his world tour to come and meet indira gandhi and krishna is recommending karma yoga gyan yoga but prabhupad is recommending bhakti yoga throughout by prabhupad is focusing on krishna's conclusive purpose throughout the gita so if we are thoughtful in understanding both the process and the purpose then we can follow the process in a way that leads to the purpose and thus we can ourselves grow and inspire others to grow in their spiritual life thank you very much hare krishna any comments or questions Yes, Madhuri. Mm. Do we have a mic? Maybe you can ask. I'll repeat. Yeah. Thanks for a wonderful class. You said that uh, that we sometimes uh, we uh, to serve the purpose, uh, we need to do things a little bit different than usual. So, uh, could you give give some practical example in in maybe even in your preaching, if you can share some experience like that? Okay. in my preaching uh, of doing some things different from the way they are done well there are many mm. 
when I started traveling to the West maybe five six years ago, initially I was thinking that to become spiritually conscious, you have to give a bodily consciousness. And at one level, that's true. And I had read and heard about how yoga has been reduced to simply body, body exercises for looking better and stuff like that. So I had this idea that people practicing yoga are in bodily consciousness. And when I, when I went abroad and especially in America, I was invited to give talks at yoga studios. And then after that, people would ask questions. And then it struck me that many of these people were very spiritually inquisitive. So yes, normally bodily consciousness is the opposite of spiritual consciousness. Yes, but people are anyway in bodily consciousness. But what yoga outreach can do is that use people's bodily consciousness to foster spiritual consciousness. Because what is happening, if yoga helps them do what they want to do, maybe be healthier, look better, that at least increases their faith in yoga, increases their openness to the tradition from which yoga has come. And then it can give them bhakti. So traditionally we have Baldev Vidya Bhushan in his Vedanta Sutra commentary Govinda Bhashya has a whole section on critiquing yoga. And he is contrasting yoga and Vedanta. Is the six systems of philosophy in the Indian tradition. So yoga and Vedanta are two competitors, you could say. And he says how yoga is inadequate and Vedanta is conclusive. So there is that tension. Uh, and when yoga is taking people away from bhakti, we need to categorize, we need to present the difference, highlight the difference. But today, for many people, yoga is the way to bhakti. Because that opens them to the Indian wisdom traditions. Uh, so I realized that, uh, yes, it's bodily consciousness, but you could even say all bodily consciousness is not the same. There's bodily consciousness that takes you away from spiritual consciousness. And then there's bodily consciousness that opens people to spiritual consciousness. So one of the things which puzzled me when I started coming to the West was that I saw so many people have pets. And even devotees have pets. So I just couldn't digest it. You know. We already have so many attachments and why add one more attachment to it? But then as I spend years, talk with people, talk with devotees, yes, you could say it's one more attachment, but it is context. Uh, people, at, the family structure is not that intact in the Western world. People are lonely. And uh, okay, you could say that, oh, that's another material attachment. It's true. But maybe it's much better than spending your whole day playing video games or surfing the net. Just, just wasting time on social media. Maybe interacting with another living being, even if it's not a human living being. It's uh, better than just surfing the net. Or it might be just be better than sinking into depression. So yes, if one is becoming attached to a dog instead of Krishna, then definitely we don't want that. But for if somebody is in a context where I don't know, now there's one devotee, Ataji, she told me that she has started a whole, uh, she was a she was a like foster child and her only thread of stability was she had a pet dog. And she came to Bhakti and then she gave up the, she said, she was heard that dogs are attachments. So she gave it up. But then she said, when I would chant Hare Krishna, I would not think of Krishna, I would think about my dog. <laughs> <laughs> so now she realized that, you know, I just can't give it up. So now she has started like a, a, a clinic. See, for especially children who come from broken homes or, or orphans, they often get traumatized. So one of the ways to help them calm down is to keep them with pets. So she has started like a clinic, you could use that word, where there are all these pets and there are dogs and then she has put all pictures of Krishna over there. And these children play with the pets and they calm down and she tells them Krishna stories. So now so she's, uh, she's told me that actually it was my dog that brought me to God. <laughs> because when I was all alone in my childhood, a dog was the only thing with me. 
She says, everything is changing in my life. There's one thing that is stable is a dog. So maybe there is someone who really loves me. That's why this dog is still there in my life. So, so, so yes, categorical ethics would be in the, pets are attachments. Why want one more attachment? But in the context where people are living, now I am not in any way recommending devotees have pets. Please don't quote me out of the context. I am just saying that we need to understand the context. And if you understand the context, then we can present things in a way that doesn't alienate people. So for some people, that attachment to a dog might bring a little bit sattva in their life as compared to all rajas and tamas that is there. So yes, you could say everything in the material world can be a potential competitor to God. But not everybody is at a level where they can give up everything and directly turn towards God. So then what they are, what level they are at, instead of just simply criticizing that, we see, okay, in this context, this is what they need, but how can I elevate them toward Krishna? So I have come up with my own working definition of humility. It says humility means to acknowledge the complexity of reality. That reality is very complex. I cannot just take this rule and this is how. Why are you not following this rule? Not like that. Reality is complex and how best in the complex reality we can help people find a path to rise from where, where they are toward Krishna. That is actually the service attitude of a teacher of Krishna consciousness. Right. Service attitude, not just teach Krishna consciousness, but understand how from where people are, we can help them to come to Krishna. Does that answer your question? Yes, okay. yes Prabhu. So Krishna never leaves Vrindavan, it's only the expansion lives. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Swayam Bhagavan and he is away and he has to endeavor to get to Vrindavan. How do you understand that? Yes, when the Lord expands, especially in terms of where the expansion is a completely different person. Say that Krishna expands as Balrama, Krishna expands as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Then it's a it's same person but different personalities. And the different personality has different role, different, uh, different uh, mission. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission is to demonstrate devotion. And especially devotion in separation. Aidina dayadranatha hai mathura nath kadava loke se Rudayam tata loka kataram daita brahmiti kim karomyaham so this is the mood of Shrimati Radharani when Krishna has gone to Vrindavan. Hey, you are Vrindavan Nath, but you have become Mathura Nath now. We can't see you and I don't know what to do, I'm dying. I'm afflicted. So in that mood of separation, what was the ecstasy that was being experienced that Krishna wanted to experience? And the whole mood of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is uh, Krishna, uh, that separation, Radharani relishing love for Krishna in separation from him. And that's why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, most of the time, he is separated from Vrindavan. So in a sense, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's relationship with Vrindavan is like Radharani's relationship with Krishna. Her heart is constantly with Krishna, but at a Vapu level, at a, at a practical, we don't want to use the word physical because their bodies are transcendental, but in terms of practical association, she didn't get that much association of Krishna. So similarly, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his whole life was just two months in Vrindavan, but his heart was always in Vrindavan. Okay, thank you. <coughs> you are saying that we have to follow the process to get to the purpose. Basically, we have to follow the instruction of the Guru to eventually one day go back to the Lord. Yes. But then the Lord always, is always testing our determination. Why is he doing that? If we are following the process, why is the Lord testing our determination? The essence of commitment is recommitment. The essence of commitment is recommitment. We go along a particular path and the nature of the world and the nature of the mind is that they will divert us. And then we have to again come back. Get diverted, we again come back. 
यतो यतो निश्चयति मनश्चंचलम अस्थिरम ततस्ततो नियम यही तद आत्मन्य वशम नहीं यही तद वैरे वैरे वैने वैद माइंड मॉन्डर्स ब्रिंग इट बैक अंडर द कंट्रोल ऑफ द सेल्फ कृष्णा सेज़न 625 एंड 26 इन द भगवत गीता 626 प्राइमरली सो देर द माइंड में स्ट्रे अवे Krishna is giving us options and he wants to, us to choose him and not choose the other options and it is through choosing him that we show our devotion so whenever we say it's a challenge it's essentially say if we have a, challenges can be broadly of two types we can have temptations and we can have tribulations temptations oh there's so much pleasure why should I stay fixed in Krishna or tribulation there is so much trouble. I must deal with this first. I can't stay focused on Krishna right now. So, these are two main distractions that we have in life. Now, of course, we need to stay away from temptation. And if trouble is there, we need to deal with the trouble. But we don't want to, even when we have problems, we don't want to become problem conscious. We want to be Krishna conscious and deal with the problem. So we may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. We don't want the pain to consume our consciousness completely. So the test is that when the world's ups and downs come, do we just let our consciousness go in those ups and downs? Or do we still put Krishna first? And then deal appropriately with that situation. The challenge is in that sense, when Krishna is testing us, he's basically giving us an opportunity to choose him. That's the essence of the test. So I was in Australia. Uh, uh, some time ago and then some one person in Melbourne asked me this question if God is good and God wants us to do good then why are the good choices so few and the bad choices so many so I answered that's how it always is in any multiple choice exam <laughs> <laughs> so one right choice four wrong choices and the, the choice is not, if it's based on probability, then we could say the exam is rigged against us. Because the probability of choosing the right is only 20%. But the choice is not based on probability. The choice is based on education. So similarly for us, yes, there are many distractions from Krishna. And there is Krishna. So for us, we have to choose. And if we, Broadly speaking, when we have the opportunity to be Krishna conscious directly, let me say we are in we are hearing cl a class, we are doing japa. Uh, when we have the opportunity to be Krishna conscious, if we consciously strive to remember Krishna at that time, then at other times when there are provocations, there are distractions, uh, the remembrance of Krishna will bubble up within our consciousness. I don't choose this; choose me. But if you are not doing that, if during when we have the opportunity to remember Krishna, see when there is no multiple choice exam, when there is a straight choice. At that time also if we don't choose Krishna, then when the multiple choice comes, we will get confused. So, yes, life is challenging, it's never easy. Even Bhakti is, because we are doing it in the material world, again it's not easy. I write daily on the Bhagavad Gita at gitadaily.com. So I wrote, I am writing an article this now, currently that is called just because a path is the easiest doesn't mean it is easy among the various paths karma yoga gyan yoga ashtanga yoga bhakti yoga bhakti yoga is the easiest but it is the easiest among tough paths the path out of the material world is tough what to speak of the path out of the material world even living in the material world is tough so challenges are just intrinsic to the material world and uh, Krishna is testing us so that he, we have the opportunity to choose him, both at the time of the test and also when preparing before the test comes. So, thank you very much. Okay, I think we'll talk one to one. Shri Chaitanya Charitamrit ki, Shri La Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Itai Gaur Premanande.